AM Events are specialists in party wedding and event planning management. So for more information to make a booking, pop down to their showroom at Unit 2, Foundry Street, Atlas Industrial Estate in Glasgow. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Sam Samworth. How are we, Sam? I'm good, mate. How are you? Yeah, really good, thanks. First of all, <laughs> mate, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, Ex-prison officer. Worked I am. in one of UK's most notorious prisons, Strangeways, for over 10 years. Working with some serious criminals, serial killers, rapists. You've seen a lot of bad stuff inside and out. But we'll go right back to the start, Sam. Kind of where you grew up and how it all began for you. Right, me, born born and bred in Sheffield. Um, as, as far back as I can remember, uh, my mum was on her own from me being about four, my sister being about two. Tony, my dad, we call him Tony because a dad is somebody who's there for you and he never was, so Tony suits. Um, mum struggled to bring us up. We saw me granddad and grand grandma and granddad, uh, Tony's mum and dad and his sister, they were really good to us until they passed um but you know we had a lot of lovers kids you know i've seen people on your podcast who've had some horrendous childhoods we we didn't have a lot of stuff you know if, if you need a pair of shoes for school then you're on your ass flat for a month do you know what i mean my mum went we out but we had loads of love we had quite a big family like you did then you know one of my nan's sisters my auntie frida used to bake and stuff like that for everybody and it was i, I think it was a quite happy childhood but the thing that that sticks out most was your pleasing and thank yous, respecting your elders, opening doors for women, that sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? That that was instilled into us. If you go to somebody's house and they offer you something, accept it, even if you don't like it, that sort of thing. Yeah. How was the, were you in trouble yourself or anything as a boy? Uh, no, pretty good kid, really. Um, there were days, James, uh, I've got a few years on you, when, you know, as a sort of, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, eleven year old. Lived at Lodge Moor, which has got to be it's got to be the best housing estate in Europe. It's beautiful. Um it's it's going out to Rivlin Valley towards Derbyshire. And me, John and Jimmy and John's dog have been off on Moors four years all day, you know, when you could let your kids go. My mum knew where we were going and we'd just just be off on Moors yeah. all day together. So Because you played a bit of rugby? Late starter, me. Late starter. Um, I fucking hated school. I, I struggled with school, me. I weren't one for doing homework and stuff like that. I just detested the whole thing. About 15, um, started playing rugby. I basically got sacked from football, told I was dirty and, you know, <laughs> rugby lads because I was a big lad of being saying, come and join them. What hating and stuff were you at 14, 15? Um, I don't know. I, I was quite tall. Um I wasn't the biggest, you know, when you look back at the school photographs when I was 17, but, you know, I was probably maybe 5'10", something like that, uh, maybe 14 stone or whatever. But it, it definitely saved my life, and it, it, it definitely, you know, threw me 20s and that kept me on straight and narrow, so yeah. it was a good thing. Because you sent me your book. Well, you sent me in audio form because... You've obviously been watching yeah. my podcast yeah, and saying my that, history yeah, as well. <laughs> I don't read books. Um, I do audio books. So you sent me at Strange Ways, yep. which I listened to on the car coming down. Great story, by the way. Um, Thank you. A lot of people maybe think it's all about the prison life and what it was like working with terrorists, serious criminals, but it's more about your own life, so your remember, personal journey. how we brought up, yeah. you know, and sort of how you're made, yeah. how you turn out or whatever. Because so. it says your mum passed away also when you were young. It was a it was a really strange time. Um, up to about fifteen, like I say, really good. Then my stepdad come on scene. Um, at that time, I banged heads with him, um, not literally. You know, were you, <laughs> were you pr protective of your mum? Uh, not so much. I don't think. You know, um, he tried. Well, when he come on scene, I, th I think he tried to be a good dad, and he, he was he was the nearest thing to dad we ever had. Do you know what I mean? Apart from family looking after, do you know. But um, you know, as a, as a teenager and that about shaving and stuff, he's telling me how I'm going to do it and things like that. 
Um, but he was really good for my mum. And he he looked after us. We never really had anything. We didn't have a bike or anything like that until I was sort of 15. So, But it's just one of them things, isn't it? You know, yeah. I, was, I was in a funny place. And then just before my 21st birthday, so it would be September 26th. I didn't know that date till uh, my sister told me this year. Uh, my mum died just before my 21st birthday, yeah. She was only 38 um, up until me being 15, 16, like I say. She, spent, she had one or two boyfriends, but pretty much devoted her life to me and my sister. And all it was, um, she was a healthy lady. She fell down one day, banged her knee, didn't feel so good. On set here a couple of nights, doctor come and see her. Went to hospital. Um, she was in hospital for about a week. I, I only went to see her twice. The first week I went, you know, um, I knew she was going to die me. At that point, she'd gone in hospital um, because there was something going on, you know, like shot from the fall. But I remember coming home on my motorbike, took my helmet off, and I knew she was going to die, which, you know, at that point, I'm sure people weren't thinking that. And then the second week I went, the day I went, she went into a coma and never come round. But uh, within, what, a few months, I married a lass I was with then. I've got nothing against that lass. I was just in a really bad place. And within a month of doing that, I fractured my skull playing rugby. So, you know, 21 to 22, I was just in a fucked up way. The first marriage lasted about six months. Yeah, um, I think that was for a wee bit of security, yeah. just lonely. Ended up with two mortgages. Um, no bridging loan then. I actually had two mortgages working, lost my job. Lost both houses, I don't know, 17 county court judgments, something like that. And I had sort of two years in wilderness, put a lot of weight on, probably got up to 23 stone. Um, you were homeless for those two years? Right. No, no. Uh, what, probably three or four months, I had no income. I'd, I could have gone to my nan's every day, yeah. Um, but I didn't, because I was a bit proud. I, I was just starving, um, you know. My mates now and again had sort of sought me out or whatever. That's what I said in the book. I've been, I've been starving me, and I was. We were in a bad way, me and my dog, and I've been homeless, not together. I mean, probably Christmas to eighty three, eighty four. Um, sad as this may sound, we were in a house that we're going to get repossessed January. Got my dog. We got no eating. It was fucking freezing. It was Christmas Day, we had nothing. Um, I actually followed milkman. They were dropping stuff on steps then, express dairy, you know, sausage, turkeys, cream and stuff like that. I think we took a bag of potatoes. Not all from the same person either. Some, Max it up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a packet of sausage here, <laughs> bag of potatoes there, some cream or whatever, just so we got something to eat. Um, not long after that, I got a job. My dog went went to my uncle who looked after her, which I was pleased about because, you know, I cared about my dog. Um, and then I started sort of rebuild my life. However, I've got to mention Alan Brookfield. He's um, a lad I played rugby with, Sheffield Tigers Colts when I was 18. He, he um, like I say, I, I could have easily, I didn't know anyone with drugs then, I didn't know anything about drugs, I didn't have money for alcohol. I just sort of tortured myself emotionally. Like I say, I've got really good family, but I won't go to them. Pride? You know, yeah, pride, of course it is. Um, so he turns up one day, he says, right, come on, you're going to play rugby again. So I was a big, fat knacker. He come every day, took me on Winkerbank Hill. Anyone who lives in Sheffield, it's above Meadowall. And he had me running up and down hills with fucking bricks and shit like that. And him on his back and got me back fit, back playing rugby. Away you go, like a bit of focus in life again. How bad was the brain damage when you got your head injury? <sighs> um... At the time, I, I went to casualty. I um, I remember it really well. Young lad on other team, fast as fuck on wing. I was a young flanker. He was running down wing, going to score a try. I went in tackle him. His head went down. We heads. He he went to um, hospital in an ambulance. Found an ambulance. Everyone thought I was all right. I played for about another ten minutes, and then I come off bit of an headache. Anyway, that that lad ended up um, on sort of life support, and that he did come through it with no injuries, which, you know, I'm really glad about, because at the time, th that were bothering me. But um, when I went to casualty, they discharged me Saturday night and said, if I've got any problems, to go back. But one of my eyes weren't moving. 
So as you look about, it was just stationary. Saw this doctor, he didn't think anything wrong. Uh, Monday morning, I saw a consultant called Strachan at Allamshire, went in to see him, sat me down, got his pen out like they do, come out with some Latin name. What was wrong with me? He says, when did you do this? I said Saturday, he says, what did you do Saturday night? A few beers, what did you do Sunday night? A few beers. He says, well, you're not dead. So he sent me for um, a scan, got a big clot on my brain. He says, you, you know, you'd have been in hospital two or three days under observations. The fact you're walking and living now, um, I'm not, I'm not going to keep you in. So it took about two years to get my vision back properly. And then, like I said, I got back into my rugby. So. so after that, once you started getting fit again, started back playing, you became a bouncer? Uh, that, that was uh, a bit later on, uh, towards the end of my engineering career. I uh, got in a lot of bother. When I, when I got big lad and I was out working that... I Steroids? Was in, no, no. Fat eating food, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Steroids. <laughs> no, I've never said any of them, mate. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I was just big, but I, I got in a lot of fights and I ended up in uh, in court um, four times, drunk and disorderly. They used to charge you. Back then, you'd, you'd get nicked for fighting, drunk and disorderly, £80 fine and a caution. The fourth time I was in in front of the judge, um, I knew him because I'd been in front of him about three months before. The lad next to me uh, was a miner who had been scrapping with. He became a good mate, him. So what you, you'd be in the dock, literally, um, head down light, and he said, lift your head up, young man. He says, do I know you? I says, I don't think so. He says, <laughs> but what he basically said, he said, you know, I understand, you know, you like a few beers or whatever, but if I see you again, then, you know, I'll be giving you a sentence. So that was my Scarborough warning. I just put everything into my rugby then. Was that the catalyst for you to kind of get your shit together? Yeah, it was. It was really. Um, by that time, I, I had actually, you know, I'd been in engineering. Um, when I lost my houses and that and lost my job, I'd been working at kitchen knife manufacturers like, uh, you know, you go about sexual harassment and that then. There was about 30 lads work there and about 450 women. Um, just got sexually abused every day. Not literally, yeah. but, you know, they'd bend you over the machine and dry scuttle you, <laughs> some 50-year-old woman. <laughs> but, um, you know. Because you're on a bit of border as well when you were on the doors. Did a couple of heavies come down? Well, it, right, listen, let me, let me tell you about bouncing, right? Yeah. I might look the part. I am not a hard man, right? What I'm good at is talking. So my landlady, Julie, who were a lovely lass, um, like I said, despise me looks. I, I get on with people re really well, like. So I went to get this lass a massage. I need to tell you this as well because mm -hmm. it wasn't like that. Yeah, a bit of extra cash no, in the no. background. No, no. I did my Reiki, right? I've been in engineering. Um, I got married again. A really nice lass. Uh, like I said, we, we just went our separate ways. We just, you know, we didn't fall out or anything, but like you do in life, people want, want to go a different way or whatever. So. I was at a bit of a loss then, so I, I went to college. One of my friends, a uh, physio at Rugby Club, Allison, says, why don't you do a massage course? I'm running the course. So I knew her like, so I went and did the course. That were all females apart from myself. Then did aromatherapy course, Indian head course. I did my Reiki one and two. So I sort of got into the complementary therapies route. Mm -hmm. Got myself a, a little place. There was a lass on the course who had an hairdresser's. She offered me a room. Um, and away you go, massaging ladies from downstairs. She put offers on, you know, come and get your hair done, blow dry or whatever, and free back massage upstairs. She paid me for them. So I did that for two years. Um, are you not going to ask me whether anyone ever asked for extras? Or, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you want to, don't you? So, I was going to wait to see where the story went first. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> I'm going to tell you now. In, in the two years, right, really hard as a male... Um, I actually went for a job at a clinic in Sheffield, a therapy clinic. And when I turned up, the woman went, you're a man? I went, yeah, you know. She went, um, we don't employ men. They're all, all female clients, all female therapists, but she interviewed me anyway. I never understood that. However, so... Happened to all this equal rights and fucking this <laughs> and that. Do you know what I mean? Women have got a cheek I, sometimes. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, um, I had about 10 male clients a uh, couple front rugby club in two years, loads of women, uh, young women, old women, do you know what I mean? Um, 
it's quite a tough gig for a guy above a, you know, there are only females who, who come in that salon. So you, you might get some 60 year old or some 20 year old and you're giving him a, <laughs> it nearly came out wrong then. You're going to give him a massage or whatever. Mm -hmm. So first thing they want to know is what have I got on and what I ain't. So I always used to give him a little talk, sit down, have a chat. You know, keep your knickers on. <laughs> you can leave your bra on, but I have to undo it, which is embarrassing for me. So it's better if you don't. And tell them how to lie and cover themselves up with towels. Um, you know, half of them, they'd be popping bra and that before you got out of that room or whatever. So, however, Mike, so like I said, 10 guys coming through the door, that's all. So we get Mike. So the last telling me, Mike is coming for a full aromatherapy massage. About an hour and a half, two hours, hot day. Uh, goes through the talk with Mike. Comes upstairs. This guy's laid on bed with a boner on. <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> let, let's be professional. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I started this massage and he says to me, and this guy, you know, at that time I was quite fit. You know, I was probably about, I don't know, 16 and a half stone, playing me rugby, fit as fuck. Says, do you want to massage this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're fucking laughing now. <laughs> There's none of my mates know this, right? Um, <laughs> in the salon, I, I was downstairs in 15 minutes. I said to him something like, put your fucking clothes on. You're paying full price and I'll see you downstairs. So when I went downstairs, they're all like, you know, what, what? I told them, took the fucking piss, you know what I mean? Mm. And every single day I went in the salon in my appointments book it was like Mike, Mike, mm -hmm. Mike, you know. So. <laughs> so, Mike, if you're watching, yeah. keep your pants on. <laughs> yeah, so two years, I uh, I got offered extras once, and that was mm -hmm. a guy, so there you go. There you go. So um, I was just about to say I'm in the wrong industry Yeah, as well. so at the same time, I'm, I'm doing a massage gig. Julie, who I'm lodging with, this is how I got around the story, went to give her a massage. We got on. She says, I'm going on holiday tomorrow. Do you want to look after my house for two weeks? That's the first time we've met. So I says, yeah. I ended up staying there three and a half years. Um, Julie worked the doors. Nice lass. So she got me on that one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, at first, I worked in RSVP in Sheffield. Like I say, I'm not a fighter me. A lot of doormen. They're not all scrappers. But you, you know? look the part. You look like... Exactly. So, you know, you've got a bit of a presence. If you can yeah. talk to people, it's that sort of thing. Like I say, when you get to know of them, there, there is some hard bastards, don't get me wrong. But, you know, if you've got 10 doormen, a couple might be able to scrap and, and rest your back up. Most of the time, you don't end up in, you know, situations like that. However, um, I was asked by the company to go and work at Anran's. It's a wine bar opposite Northern General, sorry, Alamshire Hospital in Sheffield. Just far enough out of town so you don't get idiots. But you've got a lot of football jobs in, the top boys. So we're talking about 40, 50-year-old Sheffield United Sheffield Wednesday, top boys. And they used to associate together in there. You know, if it was like match day, twice a year, local derby, they'd be kicking shite out of here. In there, very civilised, and they mixed. And there was no one in there to know that they mixed, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, used to get a few people in. Phil Oakey, Human League, like I say, you're a bit younger than me. I don't know him. <laughs> Have you heard it, Human old, League? Old bastard, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, oh, Jarvis Cocker. I know Jarvis, yeah. Right, yeah, Jarvis yeah, yeah, Cocker, yeah. what a scruffy twat yeah. he was. Um, <laughs> I can't believe, so Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday fans used to drink together. No, right. When I said fan, these are top boys. These are people who've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be six of one, six of other. Match day, like I said, they'd be knocking shit out of each other. They were the proper art. They're like the elite. Do you know what I mean? Fair play for that, but... Back in Glasgow, though, there was no way Celtic and Rangers fans... No way. Because they would fucking kill each other. I'd, I'd, I could talk to you. I was about that because, uh, you know, I've got a mate up there who is like Rangers through and through and he's absolutely barmy. So is our Stephen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm not into my football. I, I just, you know, it, it is a bit crazy, isn't it? Yeah, that's one of the biggest rivalries in the world that's it's heavy. Yeah. No way they could sit and have a baby... Just because it, if, no matter if it's Old Fun Day, New Year's Day, Christmas Day, somebody's birthday, they ain't sitting next to each other. 
It's just pure hatred. <laughs> Even for family members and that. Some of my family members don't get in the house because of it. Team really? support. Nah, I'm not bad. I'm not bitter. But my family's all mixed. My family's more Rangers, to be fair. But it's um, people would fall out for years and years over stupid results. No. Crazy. Absolute crazy. Well, moving swiftly on then. Um, <laughs> there were a few other minor celebrities. Um I did that about 18 months on my own before they put someone else on. But when I was on my own, they had uh, a local Sheffield gangster. I don't know if he's still alive now. I'll not mention him just in case because he was a f horrible bastard. Mm -hmm. um, and Casey. his henchman, who was another horrible bastard. Casey comes to your door asking for a massage. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah, quite possibly. Um, anyway, they turns up one night. So the landlord, who was a nice lad, Neil, um, it, it barred him because he was he was well known in Sheffield. He was an horrible bastard. He used to carry knives, weapons, and shit like that. Yeah. And his sidekick was equally, you know, he was well known for cutting people up and that. So they turned up one night, like, and the bigger of the two, one of them was a bodybuilder, black lad. Uh, I don't know, twenty four inch arms. He was massive. Um, stuck a gun in my face. So he says we're coming in for a drink. Says, oh, all right then, 8.60 now, I'll go and get a drink. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I followed him in. Neil saw straight away, he looked at me like, he just rolled his eyes like one at lasses. Anyway, he walked up to the bar. Surprisingly enough, the pub emptied pretty quick. Um, Neil was from Nottingham. He'd had, he'd had a poop boozer in Nottingham. Guy walked in with a crossbow. Armed response in Nottingham, less than five minutes, all over the place. Dealt with it, yeah. So the 999 in Sheffield, armed response turned up uh, 50 minutes later. Walked up to the door, I'm outside, Neil's having a roll in. That was my first fag, that. He says to me, do you smoke? I says, nah. He gave me an old Auburn or something. Coughed me guts up and I felt really sort of... Sick. Yeah, sick, but quite light-headed. It was really pleasant. I decided at that point that I weren't going to have another. I said, I am smoking, but there you go. Anyway, this copper walks up. He's got all these boys behind him in the van. Where have they? So Neil says, they left fucking 40 minutes ago. We gave the reg number. Yeah. Uh, was it real gun? Says to me. I said, how the fuck do I know? <laughs> <laughs> says, he says, well, did you get a look at it? I says, you stuck it in my head here. You can still see it, Mark. Anyway, that were by the by. They did jack shit. They got away with that. I was really shocked by that. But that was pretty much my last gig there. Um decided at this time oh in fact i need to tell you so my mate at this time has got me onto another gig because i work in the doors the doorman's course was pretty basic and it's, it's a lot more serious now he says i am working he was a prison officer at these forensic units right they were female units mental little mental health hospitals if you like specialist he says you're good at talking to people I can get you a job there. So he did. Now, these two units, um, I'd never seen anything like it. There was uh, there was one at Chesterfield, one at Mansfield. The one at Chesterfield I worked at most, it was uh, like a little Premier Lodge, Premier Inn, you know, a budget hotel. Maybe 20 rooms upstairs, 20 down, 11 lasses upstairs, maybe seven down, yeah, and the staff. So the first day, I'm upstairs, I goes upstairs. There was a, a lovely lady, about 60, mental health nurse. Sat down, about five of us. She says, right, who are you? So I told her, what's your experience? Which was like pretty much zero. A uh, couple of healthcare assistants. So we had a bit of a briefing. Everybody does this in mental hospitals. She says, right, there's a the last we're going to deal with first. She's come from another home. She likes to lay in bed all day. She's not doing that here. So what we'll do, the five of us are going to go in before we, we get anyone else, deal with them. If she won't get out of bed, we're going to pick her up on a mattress, put it in the corridor, and then lock her door. And she can go and have a shower because you've got bad personal hygiene. So I thought, okay, fair enough. Like, So we did that. Picked this lass up, refused to get out of bed. As we put her to the floor, she jumped up, twatted the old lady straight in the face, banged me in the nose, um, spat in someone else's face, and we were in a bit of a fight situation. In mental health then, at that time, I don't know now, with females particularly, what you try and do is just restrain them, not hurt them, just, you know, like restrict the movement or whatever, stop them hurting themselves. Did they get injected with anything? 
we can talk about that. They used to way back when. Just now, a jagging ass bang. If, if, if someone was mm. having a serious psychotic op- episode, same with prison. You know, if you go back to the sixties and seventies, they get it out and just jab people left, right, and centre. You've had some guys on here who've been uh, yeah. on your podcast, who've, yeah, in prison. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I've had a lot of people on the other side who yeah. fucking hate screws exactly. because of the beatings they have exactly. received over the years. Exactly. Listen, there's always two flips of the coin. Of Do you know what I mean? Of course there is. There's always they they blame each other. The screws will blame them. They'll blame the screws. But right, listen, so yeah. I've, I've been asked before why I've got no social media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's Messenger. People have found me on Messenger and contacted me. Here's the thing. You've just said it in one. How many people have been to prison in this country, do you think? Thousands. Yeah. Thousands. How many are still alive? 60s, 70s, 80s. So you've got all them people that will remember all the bad screws, the brutality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All their families will remember it. The press has always been negative. You know, half the people I work with, I fucking hated. <laughs> uh, your managers didn't like you. Your governors didn't like you. The two prison service union and POA, Prison Officers Association, the two unions can do fuck all and government ain't got a clue. So as a prison officer, you know, with a book, why am I going to put myself on, it just be hate. I know you've said about hate, you like to take them on, you know, you might get 10 positive comments and mm-hmm. then somebody will say something mm-hmm. and you like to have a go. You know, I'd be lucky if I got one positive comment once after. You'd think that because, hate. you know, you're, I've looked at your reviews and stuff and everybody sees, you're, it says even on the book as well that you come across as that, but you've got a soft heart. Well, it, it's true. Pe- people look at you. I probably mm-hmm. look like a typical screw, don't I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, why is that? Why the fuck do you all look the same? Do you go to the same hairdressers or do you do this? What What is that look? Is there a certain look? Tattoos? I've over always six looked feet? like this. I've always looked... I've, Played rugby in that, do you know what I mean? Too sorry. No, I do reiki. I do reiki. <laughs> I do reiki as well. Yeah, well, <laughs> there you go, you see. Reflexology, you know, complementary uh-huh. therapy. Well, is, so. there, there's always that look. It's like the people you surround yourself with, the people you become, I always say it. Is there a certain, because every screw is kind of over six feet, no hair, tattoos, kind of look let, as if Let me tell you, all right, you might think majority would, but I, I've said this before. If you've got a thousand screws, in fact, let's take 100 screws from Strange Ways, right? You, you get somebody who, um, well, like a ballet dancer, I'm on about a male now, not a female. Um, you get everything through. You get pretty girls, you know, to like the lesbian look, to like, you know, your your housewife, to your granny, and men same. You know, you get some who's effeminate, some big hard tattooed bastard, some who looks like she should be in dad's army or something like that. <laughs> you, you get them all. Unfortunately, in the press, um, it always seems to be the same. And, <laughs> and, and, and I've done it no favours, have I? <laughs> no, you you know, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't help how I look, yeah. can I? It's just unfortunate that. Yeah, but, you, you know, I, I understand the negativity. My, mm. my mate worked um, 80s, 90s, and he were a fighter in, he's a proper fighter. He had a lot of one-in-ones in prison. You get some hard bastard, you know, people would fetch him, have a straightener in a cell. He weren't one for like going in mob handed and kicking fuck out of people. Yeah. But he says people do that. And he, he called them like, you know, like roaches and vultures. People will just, people who wouldn't do it away from that job. It's just like a pack mentality, do you know what I mean? Do you think you should just get a fucking boxing ring and shove it in the middle of the jail? And if people have got problems, get the gloves on and get in fight it out with men. Right, right. that that culture's dying out because, mm-hmm. you know, um, people who are of that ilk are getting to an age now where they're leaving the prison service. The private sector, I, I saw some brutality in the private sector. Not saw it, I saw the aftermath because people also pick their audience, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um so uh, there's very little that I saw in front of me and, and I did see people get pulled. But private sector inevitably starts off with new staff, so there's no culture. The prison service did have this macho, yeah. bollocks, brutal, you know, what what happens in prison stays in prison yeah. type shit. What happened then? How long were you in the healthcare system? Uh, it's just a wing. It's just a wing like any mm-hmm. other. Um, we had some cells that were called safe cells. They were different to a normal cell. But I was actually on there seven years, so... And how was that mentally for you? Um, if you've got feelings in humanity, uh, it's not good. Do you have to come, become cold? 
towards that no, to seeing the way people no, struggle I, I, and... no 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 when i first went into prison uh <laughs> i struggled I, I struggled on training i was too too loud from yorkshire called people love i got slapped down straight away you know told that wouldn't pass the course i was a bully and everything um so that was quite difficult when i went into prison i went on k wing in strange ways which is a big wing 40 staff on there you know it, it took some strength of character to remain yourself and not get it up. A lot of people um, are what I call chameleon officers. If you work with decent people, you know, because there is good people, don't yeah. get me wrong, then they're good. If they work with um, people who are lazy, they become lazy and that sort of thing. Um, How long was the course to get into Strange Ways? Eight weeks. Private sector was nine weeks. We had... Uh, there was a lad actually from, I always say it wrong, is it Balini? Bellini? Balini. Right, Balini. Yeah. Right, Dave Bogue. Mm -hmm. if, if you're watching this, Dave, top guy, this guy, he was a screw up Bellini for 19 years, then did psychology. He took me in the private sector, our course, uh, a week, a week's course on interpersonal skills. He was fucking brilliant. CNR, where you learn to restrain prisoners, is a week of your training. You do that private and public. And like I say, in the private sector, Dave Bold took us for interpersonal skills. Rest of it is a load of bollocks. It's antiquated. It's classroom stuff. It's role play. Uh, it's homework. Shite. So the stuff that you learned on that course, is that relevant when you actually go into yeah, of course the, it is. To the big in, boys In the field? private sector, they, they took us into the jail more in the private sector. When they first put you in there, fucking... There's not as many staff in private sector, yeah? When they say cons run a jail, you know, they're in your face all the time. Every private jail will have opened up with the worst population ever. Because mm -hmm. if, they, if they said to, like, strange ways, or oh, there's a prison opening up, send, send 15 prisoners, they're not getting the guys who are on the PlayStations, are they? The capacity you know? for strange ways, of, is that 1,000? Uh, it's between eleven and 1,200, mm -hmm. something like that. But... You know, inevitably, private jails got dumped on back in the day. You get all the shit prisoners. There's not as many staff. It'd be in your face. But the training is so antiquated, and they stick with it. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's boring, and it teaches you nothing. What was your first day like in Strange Ways? Um, it was all right. I went Nervous? On to, I, um, do you know what I did? I decided, forget, forget your words in private sector. Go in there, like you know, the, the other people who are just new to the job and just see how it's run because it was totally different to the private sector. So the, if you ask me how my first day in the private sector was, the first shift I worked on B1, which was young offenders, 18 to 21, worst age group. Yeah. Yeah. Try to make a name for themselves. Yeah, you can imagine. There's me, Adi Erna, Steve Turnbull, uh, three lads. We were all on the same course, all brand new. They ran as ragged all day. It was horrendous. Strange ways were a lot different, a lot of experience there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Older staff, a good mix of staff. So it was quite an enjoyable day. Yeah, so once you started getting, finding your feet, obviously there's a lot of bad stuff in there because in the book as well, well, what I listened to, there was someone who used to set themselves on fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We used an alias in the book. I can't remember the aliases, right? The, the reason some people, we used aliases, it's about dealing with things like fires and dirty process. So you don't need to know the people, you don't need to know the names. So we we used aliases. Obviously some of high profile prisoners are mentioned. But yeah, the guy you're on about, I can't remember what we call him in the book. Um but yeah, he I didn't actually see him when he he set his self on fire first time. What he did, and this is what people have to know he was a prolific self armor that guy. But he got nothing out of it. It's not manipulative. Everyone will tell you self-harm is manipulative. Yeah? Just briefly going back, when, when I was in them friends at unions with women, horrendous self-harm, like punishing themselves or working out frustrations or things like that. Because loads of them, were, in fact, all them women had been abused as kids, you know? But they didn't get anything from it. It's like almost punishing yourself. They're just to pain, they're just to misery that they do it on themselves. Yeah, just to... and... and Unfortunately, in mental health, there's a lot of learned behaviour. So the lasses, one one might insert things under the skin, another might, 
you know, cut or burn themselves. They, they learn from each other. So this guy, um, just thought I went on the health care, frustrated or whatever. He bought sugar on the canteen, prison canteen. Shoelaces around his tracky bottoms, filled his tracky legs up with sugar and set himself on fire. You know what sugar's like? Bun. Yeah, burn his fucking legs, mate. The first time I saw his legs, he got a bit, big lump of calf muscle missing. His legs were crooked. They looked like a, a, a man of 100 years old and it, it physically affected how he worked. But that, that, other than inconvenience for staff and him being in hospital and stuff, you know, he was punishing himself. The same guy, I saw him cut his arm, six big cuts down to wood with a razor blade. I, I, got, I got questioned about this. So I'm outside the cell, he's kicking off. So he's produced a razor blade out of his mouth and he's down to wood. No thought, looking at me, down to wood, right? Anywhere in the jail, if someone self him, they'd be an alarm bell. The thing with this guy, if you stop him, he'd have just done it. If, if he hadn't finished, he'd have done it later. He'd have got something from somewhere else. So I'm trying to talk to him. You know, come on, what are you doing? That Bam, bam. Six big cuts, deep. So I said, have you done now? Fuck off. Do you know what I mean? Fuck off, Mr. Samworth. Not fuck off, your knobhead or, old, or screw boy. Mr. Fuck Samworth. Off. Yeah. You must have had a bit of respect then for um, the best of I, 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 I got on well with him. Everyone fucking detested him. He used to make me laugh. Not that. That wasn't mm -hmm. funny. But he used to make me laugh. However, he was a dangerous fucker. You know, um, he was in for Arsenal and he was dangerous. So I fetched Karen Kenny, who one was one of my nurse managers. So she's a proper nurse, uh, you know, caring, professional and all that. So she has a look. Come on, what have you done that for? Fuck off, Miss Kenny. Okay, if you need me, press the bell. Fuck off, Miss Kenny. Fuck off, Mr. Samuel. So he left him with it. Later that day, he got pissed off at somebody else. He was a personality disorder, this guy. Personality disorders are the worst people to Split deal with. Split personality. Somebody decided that to put personality disorders under mental health. They should be separate. They should be two separate things. I'm not medically qualified, but I have worked with these people. People with personality disorders... You know, you get psychiatrists that will give them antipsychotics and medication. You can't cure them with medication. All it does is subdue them, yeah? They're not going to change. They need to be managed firmly and, and they need a proper routine. But anyway, later this day, fills them with shit. So he's got six open wounds on his arm that he fills with shit. Uh, three or four days later, he's got fluid. They're obviously infected. Fluid running down his arm. we got um, a doctor in. He was a plastic surgeon from Withenshaw Hospital. So <laughs> I'm going to use his name. I don't know where he is, but it's hard not using his name. So we'll just call him Johnny Boy, yeah? So I says, Johnny Boy, there's a doctor here to see you. Fuck off. I don't want to see him. Just see him. I'm not having no treatment. Well, that's fine. Just see him, please. He's here. See him. We can say you've seen him. Job done. Okay, he agrees to that. So he comes out to see this plastic surgeon. Plastic surgeon recoils in horror. Fuck him. He didn't obviously swear, but, you know, he stank his arm. There was an officer with me who threw a whitey. You know what I mean? He looked at it. He's gone. He's gone away him. He's he's seen enough. Um, they were obviously filled with puss and shit like that and fluid running down. Another one of my managers, Karen Bradbury, mental health nurse, is there. So the surgeon says, um, can I have a look? No. Can I take pictures? Yeah, he can take pictures. So he took some pictures. He says to him, are you taking antibiotics? No. He says, you know, he gets sepsemia, he'll die. He says, so I'll fucking die. Went back in his cell. Do you know what I mean? He didn't take any antibiotics. Two weeks later, they've healed. You know, me or you would probably be dead or in hospital. Seriously, they've healed. Uh, that weren't the only thing he'd done. So um, what's the protocol then for if someone cuts themselves? Do you, what happens if they're dying and they don't want you like you in that room? It, what's your job to do? If it had been life-threatening... You know, if you come on, so it was fucking bleeding to death. Preserve life. That's what you're taught. Preserve life. Any situation, preserve life. There's no leaving someone to bleed to death or something like that. Why are those guys in prison? Why are they not in a mental institution? Right. He, he eventually went to Rampton, right? Three high security hospitals. You've got Ashworth Hospital, Rampton Hospital and Broadmoor. We've all heard of Broadmoor, haven't we? Mm -hmm. He, he was a bad case. He was a bad personality disorder, prolific self-harmers. They 
they usually end up in the the highest secure places. You've got low secure, excuse me, low secure mental health, which is literally might be a ward in a hospital, just with a, a security key, you know, put a code in. So if somebody stood behind a nurse, they can walk out, they can get off. You've got medium secure, where people will be locked on a unit. And then obviously the high security estate, such as where he's going ramped and, you know, that's where all the real dangerous fuckers go, right? Yeah, because um, it's in the book also that there was a prison riot because Turkey got, took off the Christmas menu. Oh, there wasn't, right. It's funny you should mention that. Uh, one of my mates fell out with me because of this, but, you know, that's how small-minded he is. So, Christmas Day. Prisoners and food, right? People will never understand. You see your adverts on Facebook, you know, all people get fuck all. Prisoners get, like, three meals a day and all this bollocks. Uh, prison food is a big issue. If you've got shit food at a jail, you know, you're going to bother. There's been riots. Blake and Hurst. Remember when I was in private sector, we got 19 lads. 12 o'clock at night, the jail shut down. 19 lads in reception. I'm walking them down to E-Wing. You're right, lads. Where are you all from? Blake and Hurst. Now, if there's that many, they have what they call overcrowding drafts. If your prison's full, but you need to take prisoners... They'll ship prisoners around the country. So I says, overcrowding draft. He went, no, we rioted today, boss. I says, rioted, great. We've got 19 rioters all together, 12 o'clock at night in a private jail. So I says, are you going to riot here? He says, no, what's the food like? I said, the food's really good. He says, you won't see any riots. Yeah, food's important. It's Christmas Day. Again, people will not understand why they're cooking prisoners a Christmas dinner on Christmas Day. You know, why don't they give them a fucking sandwich? Or, you know, why are they getting that? You've got prison officers who look after these guys, yeah? That is part of it. You can imagine Christmas Day in prison. I worked every Christmas Day, me, and I'd have Boxing Day off with my family. There was no point me having Christmas Day off to have to work Boxing Day, so I'd do it that way. It's fucking miserable. All they want to do, the cons, is come out, speak to the family, if they can get on a phone, and they've got some phone credit, have the meal and go behind the doors. It's miserable. You know, it's the worst time. Yeah, just want to get it over with. Yeah, it's also potentially a dangerous time. New Year is always highlighted at a risk time for a riot. So this particular day, I'm um, what I call the cleaning officer. So I've been charged with the cleaners and I'd run the serve rate where you serve meals. So a lad who was on our course, Two Pens, who'd been on the day before, he was called Two Pens because he was always writing prisoners up, you know, giving them warnings. So joking aside it'd be like that he was the clean officer previous day and what he used to do you'd order the food for the following day so about 11 o'clock i phones the kitchens i haven't seen my order donna who's in the kitchens what we got today now i'm expecting we got 200 prisoners on kaylee i'm expecting 150 christmas dinners maybe 30 halal meals for your muslims and that Maybe 20 butty packs. Some lads would only eat sandwiches. They wouldn't eat prison food. Donna comes back. 160 fish curry. I says, fucking fish curry? So she started laughing. I says, what are you laughing at? She says, who's fucking ordered this? I says, have you not looked? She said, all she gets is the sum total of meals that they're cooking. And then they send them. I says, there'll be a fucking riot on this wing. Now... Somebody who was, again, who, who said this is bollocks, it wouldn't happen. They were talking about Donna. So I'll tell you about Donna. She's lovely lass. She's left now. So if she ever sees this, mm -hmm. good on her. I got on with everyone, me. I was polite. The odd times I had to work in the kitchen, if, if she asked me whether I'd help with something, I'd help, whatever it was. Some officers wouldn't. Some officers, old school, they'd sit in a chair and read a paper and they won't lift a fucking finger. I did. So I got on well with her. And somebody said... You know, she she wouldn't give me a fucking steam off her piss. But the officer, in, I wouldn't have given him steam off my piss either. Anyway, me and her got on. So I says, you cannot send 150 portions of fish curry. There'll be a fucking riot on this wing. So what I did, I got all the cleaners together. I said, right, I want you to go around every cell and tell them all, two pens, yeah, has stitched me up. I used his name. I won't use his name on here. I like him. He's left now. So no hard feelings, yeah? Anyway, I got them all to go out and tell every... I said, tell every fucking cell, 
As it stands now, there's no Christmas dinner. It's fish curry, but I'm trying to sort it. Because when they got down there, I didn't want no surprises. The rest of the staff are upstairs having brews, yeah? One of my good friends were there. Um, she knows this happened. The SO knows it happened because I went and told him, my manager straight away, he went fucking bananas. Anyway, come dinner time, uh, the staff all go and unlock the prisoners. The food come. Donna did us proud. There was fucking shitloads of food. Whatever we left in the kitchen, she sent, there was eggs, fried eggs. You don't get fried egg in prison. See people's faces. You give someone a fried egg Christmas day. There was fish curry, which weren't that bad, and shitloads of food. Nobody was starving, and there was no riot, which is what some of my critics said. But there wasn't. But there could have been the potential there. If it hadn't been for the lass in the kitchen... Yeah, and that's all it takes. Mm. People need to understand that. Yeah, people just want, even the prisoners, obviously they're in there for a reason. Of course they are. But they still want a bit of respect. People hate getting told what to do. Do you know what I mean? So it can be difficult. How bad was the suicide rate in strange ways when you were there? Did you see a lot of deaths? Right, deaths in custody. Let me talk about them. That's a, that's a good subject because you, you've asked about specific jails and I've seen a lot of jails, you know, strange ways got a high suicide rate. So some at deaths in custodies, half the deaths in custodies while I were there were nothing to do with strange ways, right? The people who kill themselves, um, you have people, for instance, paedophiles. There was one lad I remember who killed himself. He got found guilty. He never accepted it. He said he would kill himself if he got found guilty, and he did. If he'd have been in any jail in the country, if he'd been in a Scottish jail, he would have killed himself. So people try and equate suicides to a particular jail as though that jail is at fault. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I know it's got it's gone up since 2015 because English and Welsh jails are on their ass. Uh, there'll be a lot more bullying and things like that, self-harming, assaults and stuff like that. So the, the suicide rate, it, it could vary. It depends on your population. Yeah. There's also lads. This never gets mentioned, this James. And if you say, it, it was more than half, but let's say half the people I worked with I didn't like, for whatever reason, lazy, bullies or whatever, 50% of the people I worked with were good. It was more than that, but let's say 50%, yeah? No one ever says how many lives you've saved, how much bullying you stop, how much safer you make it, yeah? 2013, 2014, best summing up this, the outgoing prison inspector, so a prison inspector, prison inspections, people shit themselves. They can come into your jail unannounced, yeah? They can go anywhere. They can talk to anyone. The last the last one before 2.15, he said, um, for safety, for prison staff relationship, bullying, everything, strange ways, possibly the best prison inspection he'd ever done. That was 2013, 2014. See, I didn't know that. Strange way it stands out to me as being like a fucking dungeon. Because, <clears throat> you know, it's a Victorian jail. You've got to understand. Yeah. 1800s, that was about Yeah, that. of course. It's a Victorian jail. You know, it's like Armley. Liverpool's probably the mm. worst condition. They're trying to rectify that. But so, Lenny must be up there yeah, with of one of the is. worst. Of course it is. But I will tell you now, prisoners, when they're complaining about conditions, it's not going in a cell in strange ways that's got spiders in corner and a bit of mould and needs a paint. It's because they're getting banged up all day again. There's not enough staff to get them out. So if you look 70s, 80s, bare bang up, 23 hours a day, brutal system, slopping out, yeah? Early 90s, strange ways riots. Then they started getting prisoners out. You know, more association, sending people to work. Now, because they've got no staff, it's going back to dark ages. Yeah. They're getting banged up more and more. It's about 40 grand per inmate for everyone that's in the prison in the UK. It's just that, for me, it's a system that's failing. A system that I think over 70% of prisoners in prison always go back. It's not really set it's up. It's more than that. I'm sure it's is more it? than that. I thought it came re down re 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 Reoffending rate is horrendous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think should be put in place then to try and maybe change the prison system, because the numbers are getting higher. People are more depressed. People are more suicidal. More people are on drugs. More people are on drugs in prison than they are out. I was in Berlin in 2007, and there was more people fucked up in the jail than there was out in the streets, which is crazy. It is. Well, okay. 
I'll sum it up with a lad who, who lived near me, 100 metres away when I lived in Manchester. I've moved away now, yeah. He's a lad I'd known since, uh, I'd known him 15 years, an ex-customer. I don't like the word ex-con or ex-prisoner because if you've got that stigma, you know, it sticks with you, doesn't it? Yeah. So he was an ex He's He is a lad who will always be going in prison. We had these chats with him, long chats, you know. He was a little fucker when he was younger, quite violent and that. So he, he's just done a tour recently, 18 months. He was in Strange Ways, Forest Bank, where I both were, Risley, which is a cat scene. He was in Liverpool jail. And he used drugs. He's never used drugs. So I says, you know, what? why use it? The reason I knew, he, he got what looked like a big scar. He looked like he'd been slashed. I said, what is it, that? He said, it's a burn. I says, what's that from? He says, taking spice in jail, passed out on radiator, four hours, woke up, full thickness burn on his arm. I said, did it not wake you up? He says, you bang out when you take it. I says, why are you taking it? He says, you're getting banged up more and more. Young staff, you can't get anything done. It's becoming more violent, so people are turning to drugs. That's why more. he's never taken drugs. 20 years ago in prison, he's never touched drugs. He sold drugs and took drugs in, but he's never used them, and he's using now, and that's why. Yeah, it's, but again, people can't handle the sentences. They're just feeling like caged animals. So it's you easy. Can't handle bang yeah, up, mate. It's, it's easy to just go down the route of taking Valium, methadone. Yeah, just right, to, methadone, methadone. You know what? So how bad was it? How much drugs were involved in strange ways also? Was it... If you go to pre-214, you've always, you've always got an element, haven't you? Mm -hmm. So anyone who's watching this or anyone who might be in government who can't understand how drugs get in jail, if officers civilians and prisoners are going in jail it's only going to be drugs because they'll stick them up their ass. Mm -hmm. last resort people need to know that that's how they get them in it's nothing um what would you do now what would you do now is that what you're saying or? yeah what do you think can change for the system the prison system something we hadn't talked about dynamic security that's the relationship between staff and prisoners mm -hmm. that's why strange ways got a a glowing report it was staff prisoner relationships yeah and they've no longer got them relationships you know I, like the lad who lived near us i'd known him 15 16 years through prison so he knew me you can blag you'll know yourself if you've been in prison an officer might blag that is a decent screw but other people will know you know what you see is what you get prisoners will sush you out straight away however them relationships i've worked with knobheads in there and somebody's come up and said, Mr. Samworth, if you hadn't been with that knobhead, I'd have banged him out because <laughs> of the way we're behaving or talking. And also, they'll come and tell you things. Sometimes they tell me on purpose, sometimes they don't. But staff-prisoner relationship keeps it safe, or did. Now they're going back to bang up, it's becoming task-oriented. My last six months, you know, very little interaction with prisoners. You're just doing a task. Go here, do an exercise, right? Go to that wing and do this, do this. A lot of new staff, there's no interaction. You know, people, somebody might might be going to twat me on K-Wing. Yeah, I don't like that officer. Somebody else might say, he's all right, Mr. Samworth. You know, you're out of order. He's, he's a mm -hmm. decent lad. All that's gone. There's no, no prison yeah. staff relationships. So what they need to do is they either go back to bang up 23 hours a day, but you'll never have the staff you used to to deal with the animosity. It used to be shitloads of staff. You know, K-Wing used to have like two SOs and 25, 30 staff when all prisoners were banged up. When I left, there were six on landing with 200 prisoners, two on each landing. So they either go back to banging people up and manage it like that, or they need to get the right staff, look at training and start getting prisoners out again. Forget everything else. Get them out on landings. It used to be boring, James. Mm. You know, Saturdays on K-Wing, I'd be stood with old Bob A, bless him, who's not here anymore. He was a cracking screw. You get back eight, stood on landing, you know, a bit of a tea belly having your bruise, and you'd just be chatting with prisoners. You could see what they're doing when they're out. You can see up to who's no good, who might be a bit down and stuff like that. All that's gone. So when you're in that, when you're in the system, see when you see suicides, people setting themselves on fire people self-harming is there things in place for you to go and get help to go and speak to people Fuck all. or do you just go home and kind of my accept friends, it my two nurse managers and i was saying to them nothing nothing in place at all do you know what i mean the the, the last death in custody i dealt with you have a hot debrief 
So actually involved, hands-on with that prisoner, there was um, three nursing staff and two officers, me and my mate, yeah? The hot debrief, there were 30 people in, laughing and joking, getting bruised, anger's on. You're supposed to have a cold debrief, so maybe a month later, come back, see how people are... There's fuck all, mate, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you go home, you have your nightmares, you come back to work the next day, no time off. It's your friends, you talk about it to your friends. Where was the, like the paedophiles, the sex offenders? Did you ever interact with them? Um, that's a good question. I, I never, I, I couldn't have worked on that wing. I did work on there on overtime, the odd shift. What was that like? Um, you're on a shift. If they didn't know you, they wouldn't talk to you. You know, it was just a vile community. Mm -hmm. It was, you know what's going on on there. Yeah. Um, you get your odd person turning tricks for people. You don't really want to know that. Excuse me. Um, it, it was like a den of iniquity. You know, it's easy. When, when you're there, you don't see it. People aren't interacting with you. And because I didn't work on there, you're not necessarily knowing what people are in for other than the high-profile ones. However, you know, you could tell it had got an atmosphere. Um, and like I said, they're just networking. For me, rape, offences against kids, they do not carry any sort of tariff. That, that's of any worth do you know what I mean if you look in America they're going to start with 30 years if there's a second offence they're getting lifed off mm -hmm. over here you know I remember one school teacher coming in and also a lot of these people are so up the self so I'm interviewing this this guy um, not about his crime just giving him a first night induction that he had to do with prisoners it's like a duty of care you know tell him what he can expect what will happen the following day, etc. So he says to me, I know all this, my solicitor's told me. He says, and if I don't get what I'm entitled to, my solicitor will be contacting a prison. Absolute arsehole. He'd been grooming kids in a school in Berry for years. Yeah, and he got 18 months. 18 fucking months. So he'd be out in probably seven. Yeah, it's fucking disgusting. Those boys... In prison with a couple of grams of coke and they're doing two and three years. Fighting. Yeah, and there's, the sex offenders are getting a slap in the wrist. That's why they're, they're repeating again, because they're getting fuck all done. For me, it, it's dead easy with sex offenders. They're tagged for life. Fuck your human rights. Do you know what? Mm -hmm. Women, kids, and men, because some men are raped. Yeah, yeah. They're tagged for life. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're on a tag and you go into your school, bam, 12 mum, to serve, put them back in. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There was some high-profile names. Harold Shipman was in Strange Ways. You weren't working at the time. They say he... He, he was there yeah. when I was there, but he was just an horrible bastard he, again. He says that he killed over 200 people. Yeah. One of Britain's most yeah, biggest was serial very, killers. Yeah, very calculated. He was a fucking horrible bastard. Not because he'd done that. He was horrible anyway. Do you know as a character? See, here's the thing as well, James. Some people, um, irrespective of their crime, come in jail do the time, and they'll be re re polite, polite and respectful. When I was on healthcare, some of our orderlies, they're the cleaners, but we called them orderlies because they were working in a small community. We had a lot of female staff, not a lot of officers, so they helped you out. Some of the hardest bastards in Manchester we had on there, cleaning, you know, mopping. Can I do all oh, Mr. Samworth? Is your wife good at gym? Dead polite and that. So it's how people behave, mm -hmm. where... A lot of people, particularly on sort of the VP wing and that. What's are, the VP wing? Vulnerable prisoners, sex mm -hmm. offenders. Uh, sometimes, I mean, we put a lad off healthcare. He couldn't stay on healthcare. He was a young lad. He was only about 21. He looked about six. He ended up on VP wing um, because he wouldn't have survived in jail. He was gay, obviously. He was weak. They were fearful of putting him on normal wings. So instead... He got placed on the VP wing with all your paedophiles and everything else. Was there a lot of rapes in prison? There were a few on that unit. Um, prison rape, I suspect it's not prevalent, yeah? I suspect there's more than gets reported on. When I was on K-Wing, uh, we had uh, a lad. Oh, he was a black lad. He was a big lad, six foot two, big build uh he came to me and the lad i were working with can I have a chat you know he was obviously distressed tearful well thinking fucking hell what's going on here you know he says the guy who he alleged had done it 
was now on another wing. You know, we're like, why didn't you come at the time? He says, look at me. Am I going to come to you and tell you? Anyway, police got involved, but then he, he failed to follow it up. There's a difficulty as well with the police and the Crown Prosecution about serious assaults that's on both prisoners and staff and, you know, such as rapes and things like that about them taking it on. It's almost like they don't give a shit, you know. Yeah, because, again, it's high-profile names. Who was the boy with the one eye who... Cregan, Dale Cregan. Yeah, invited the police officers and shot one dead. What was he like? Right. Uh, I, I didn't put him in, but you know why? I, I won't give him time of day. He was a piece of shit, a coward. Um, Had he done a few murders? Was he on the run for murders? He killed his son, right. He killed his son. Um, it all started, you can look at it on the internet, but there was a dispute in a pub. So he was asked to warn someone or threaten someone. So he took a gun to the party because he couldn't fight. He always had people with him who could fight, but he couldn't fight. So he took a gun, uh, let off a few rounds and unintentionally, we believe, ended up killing a guy. Now, his father, you know, basically said, because they know who'd done it, said, you know, you've killed my son, I'm going to kill yours, because he had a small child. So he went after his father, killed him. And then, because police were harassing everyone he knew, including his family, massive murder run, um, he lured two young lasses uh, to somewhere in Manchester and brutally murdered them. Two police officers? Yeah two young lasses they were two young lasses you know and I'll tell you something about that as well 99% of prisoners you know they were like it's disgusting they said you know he's killed two girls at the end of the day he's murdered two girls he's a coward they weren't in support of him or anything like that people like him have to be handled in a certain way um, they want they want him to go to court on trial so you know, they're either in SEGS or health cares usually. Make sure they don't harm themselves or attempt anything. He was never going to do that. He was full of shit. The thing was, when he, when he come in, he was very cocky. He had all these boys around him. They all ended up arguing and grassing each other up. Um, and I, I can say that the last time I saw him, he was off to Ashworth Hospital because he was allegedly mentally unwell, which he, he wasn't. He was just an evil, horrible bastard. Um, and for me, people like him, that, that's why we need to look at capital punishment in this country again. You know, it's going to cost public millions to keep someone like, it's, it's a no-brainer. Do you know what I mean? He's no use. He's never getting out. Same as the lads that kill Lee Rigby and others, you know. Well, the end stranger is. Uh, no, they weren't. But, you know, people think that, that there is, there's this urban myth that there's only like 10 people who's never going to get out of jail. It's It's climbing. There's probably, I don't know, last time I was aware of it, maybe 400 their whole life. But certainly like him, four murders in America would be on death row. So what's it like for you then? Because you've done Reiki, you're able to, for people it might sound crazy, but feel energies and see energies. You As soon as you see someone, you know he's did a bad crime, but you'll say, do you know what, he's actually not a bad person, but there's certain people you feel dead cold and eerie around that we just um, know they're evil bastards. Not that many prisoners, surprisingly enough. You know, uh, I'd take people at face value. And also, prisoners react. You know, my nan always used to say to me, speak and treat people how you want to be treated yourself. And I always did. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you give them benefit of doubt or whatever. There were some some people who didn't want to interact with But not, there weren't that many that I could honestly say, hey, today, Mark Bridger, he was uh, from Little Village in Wales, took the little lass, you know, God knows what he did to her. And, you know, he was a horrible bastard, slimy bastard. Um, but it's difficult. I, t I tell you what, I always used to say, joking aside, you know, very cliched, uh, easiest job I've ever had. You know, come to work, have a laugh if you can, go home, no one gets hurt. But I think the thing that affected me in the end was the fact that, you know, if you are quite open and you get on with people and you're a people person, the lads that come on healthcare, you got to know them well, you knew the backgrounds because you needed to. You know, because there were some dangerous fuckers on there. Um, and you got a lot, like I say, a lot of female staff and that, and not a lot of officers. You need to know the background, so you, you'd have a look. And a, a lot of people who come on there were mentally unwell have been abused and that. Um, and it, it obviously affected me, but I didn't know at the time. How did the 
female staff get treated? Do they get abused a lot? I worked with two lovely lasses who did over 25 years. So they talked about um, what people had said with the good old days. One of them was 80s. They both late 80s, 90s, yeah? Proper old school then. Women weren't received well by a lot of prison officers. It was male-dominated, macho environment. However, these two said, yeah, you know, there are loads of sexual innuendos and bollocks like that. And if you run into it, I remember one last saying, she's got a massive chest, you know. I'd, I'd be running to an alarm bell or something like that and people would be wolf whistling and taking the piss. But she said, as did the other two, even though you weren't accepted at first and people had like ridicule you, you know, nicknames, sexist jokes and all that bollocks, said it was still an easy job. A lot of staff, prisons locked up all day, a lot of animosity, but plenty of people to deal with it. See if there was like a paedophile or a sex offender, someone that was an evil bastard that you've seen getting his shit kicked out of them, would there be a delay maybe to let it happen a wee bit longer or would you try and split no. it up just as fast as anyone? Staff would just react and deal mm -hmm. with it. The staff the staff that worked on the VP unit, uh, vulnerable prison unit where all your paedophiles and rapists that were, was there was probably more, surprisingly enough, more female staff than male staff. Why would, they, um, why would that happen? It was just, it was a totally different environment. It weren't like a normal wing. Um, to say it was easy, I'd be wrong. It was a different population. On the whole, there was less incidents on there. You know, because like I said, people are just, you know, they've got everything they want. They've got the networking, like-minded people or whatever. So it was just sort of a, a calmer unit or whatever. When you say networking, what the, in what way? Pedophiles. Yeah, just come in. Yeah, of course they share will. Share stories and... Yeah, of course they will. Definitely. That's fucking sick. It is, but what do you do about it? You know, they're, they're all housed together. You can't do anything about that. While you were working in Strange Ways, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? Well, pro probably not the worst. If, if you want to know what... Well, I'll tell you something that affected me really bad. A lot of people would just say I was a fucking soft ass, And people I worked with didn't see it because it was just a moment in time, you know, like a car crash where things go slower. So we had a lad, one of the lads I was talking about were brain damaged. And I knew his story. The reason I knew his story, like I said, he come on for a serious offence, sexual offence. So we got, like I said, we got a lot of female staff. So when someone come on healthcare, small community, I would have a look what they were in for, what the offence was, etc. You know, you've got to keep it a safe place. So he was a young lad, young lad, normal life, uh, about 21, uh, Live with last, got a small baby. His mother weren't, weren't that old. Mother was maybe 40 odd. Yeah. So he's living a normal life. He gets mistaken for somebody else in a takeaway at night. Another gang member gets battered by about five lads, uh, smashed in head with a baseball bat. He is brain damaged. And like I said, when people are brain damaged or stroke victims or anything like that, they can become disinhibited, which means they don't know right from wrong. So it was alleged he had done something to a friend's girlfriend. I, I don't know whether that happened or not, but they don't see anything as wrong, yeah? But he was brain damaged. So he come in. I can't remember how long we had him, a few months. I met his mother a few times. Because he was young and brain damaged, we actually had visits on healthcare, which you don't normally do. You normally have a visit all in any prison. You'll have been on visits. But we had it, so it was just in an office, me sat outside with his mother, who was really young. So from his mum's point of view, who I met, she just cried for the full hour because her 21-year-old son who's brain damaged is in prison. Um, she's got no contact with his missus. Missy wouldn't have all to do with him or child. So that you, you see that side of it. And then at this particular day, the lad was going to hospital, so it took time as everything. What, what, what they look at is whilst he's in prison, even though he's brain damaged, um, you keep the public safe because you keep them locked up. You know, there's no escapes from strange ways. So that's what they look at. So he wouldn't be a priority to go to a brain injury unit. So we had him a while. What happened with him, because he was, he was hard to manage, he ended up going on an officer unlock a protocol whereby he needed three staff to get him out. Now on that unit, most of the time he had two staff. So he ended up being behind his door quite a lot. So you've got someone who's brain damaged in a cell. He smashed his cell up. He's got no TV, 
family bathroom, yeah? Put a bed in your family bathroom and that's what you've got. You've got a toilet, a sink and a bed. He's got no TV and he became acutely unwell, mentally unwell, as well as being brain damaged. So this day, he's going to hospital the following day. I stopped, had a look in him. Inch of water on the floor. He's flooded his toilet. His toilet's full of shit, paper and all sorts. Um, there was stuff all over the floor, Weetabix and that, but you know, in, in water, it's all mulched up. It was a mess, looked like a swamp. He's got his cup dipping it in the toilet. It's full of shit and blocked. Uh, he's got a Quran in his sink that is mulched up. You know, this is not a religious statement, this. Mulched it up. He's eating big covfuls of Quran with shitty water. So I'm looking at him and he's just, you know, there's nothing there. He's just staring beyond me. So I turned to one of my managers, and this isn't callous from them. I said, have you seen him? She says, he's going to hospital tomorrow. You know, people are milling about, walking past me, and I'm looking at him, and it was a sad state of affairs. Now, people can say I'm a soft ass or whatever. Do you know what I mean? But but this was a lad whose life had been destroyed, and he stood eating a fucking Quran and drinking shitty water. Do you know what I mean? And that's that's no place. Yeah, just broke him. Yeah, I can't I can't get that out of my head. Mm -hmm. It's not the most horrific thing I've seen. And that's what that's what people think. They always think they're really bad shit. You know, like the lad self-harming. Maybe that's something I got on with him. Do you know what I mean? Um, maybe it's something to do with that. I don't know. What was Joey Barton like? Joey Barton? Why have you asked me that? Yeah, that's a good question, I think. <laughs> Okay, because he's he's a famous footballer. Plus his background, and it was I wanted to know what it was like. And Last strange was, yeah. You know what? I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you've asked me that. I never mentioned him. Um, let me tell you first. We had his younger brother and cousin. I think his younger brother was 18, and we didn't have 18 year olds at Strange Ways. And his cousin was 21. Um, they were accused and got found guilty of killing a lad. Might have been in Iton. It was somewhere in Liverpool. Um, his brother or his cousin, they they believe it was his cousin, but his his brother took a ice hack to the party. Ice pick. So his brother who's 18 and his cousin who's 21 have gone to sort this lad out who they've had bother with and one of them stuck an ice pick in his head and killed him. So we had them first. His brother um, was not 18 in mental age, he was like a kid. He didn't realize serious, his cousin was an evil bastard. He definitely did it. They got them both for it, joint enterprise. Do you know what a joint enterprise is? If I shoot your mate here, mm. yeah, and you see it, but you don't say out, yeah, we decide we're not gonna say out, and I get found done, and you get found out you were there, you can get done on joint enterprise, both get a life with sentence, mother. same with me, yeah. So that was his brother. So Joey Barton, he's, uh, he was on B-Wing, drug-free ring. It's a bit of a joke, that, isn't it? Drug-free wing. Um, it was an easy wing to work on. The staff did fuck all. They were lazy. Um, they used to pick the prisoners. It wasn't drug-free. There's no wing that's drug-free. So when Joey Barton come in, a bit of political shit went on. He came into the prison. Everyone knew he was coming in, high-profile footballer. Not this is not from our governor. I believe this come from elsewhere. Uh, the, the jail, let's say the jail was told he'd got to be allowed to keep fit. Yeah, I went on B wing. I remember there's a lass, this fucking idiot come running past me, and I mean running past me. He didn't run on stairs in jail. He didn't run. You pull someone. So I shouts after him. This female officer goes, "It's Joey." Went. Who's fucking Joey? Joey Barton. <laughs> fucking hell, mate. So he got a job, a job on the wing straight away. They sacked a lad who was decent and gave him a job on the survey, on the wing. So he got to eat pretty much what he wanted. They also made him Jim Audley. Best job in strange ways for any con is Jim Audley. Yeah. You go over to the gym in the morning, you wash all the towels, you wash gym kit, you can train when you want, you eat your food over there. They bring you back or end of day, premium. He ended up with that job. So he was allowed to keep, he fucking did it easy, that lad. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there you go, that's Joey Barton. He had an easy life in strange ways. He was on the drug-free wing, loosely speaking. Mm -hmm. um, he got as much gym as he wanted and he pretty much ate what he wanted. Yeah. Was he all right? Any grief? Uh, 
it just for me, it was a dickhead. It was just yeah. running about everywhere and Jack the Lad, you know, people gaining Mars bars for autographs and shit like that. Yeah. Swagger on. But he, he didn't yeah. do it properly. It weren't hardcore. We've had prisoners. Yeah. Prisoners come in. Oh, Jesus, what's his name? Stone Roses singer. Ian Black. Yeah. He was on uh, H Wing. Yeah. As a cleaner. No preference, no privileges, no nothing. I want to know him. We also had the uh, the lad out of uh, Happy Mondays, Bez. Bez, I know Bez. Yeah, he's like a good a lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's fucking tiny. Him. <laughs> yeah. When I saw him, he, he come in. He he'd been in before again. You know, people would be shouting things out at window. Oh, do as a dance or something like that. Yeah. But you know, came in under the radar. Just got on with his jail. Bez is a good guy. Yeah. No special, no special treatment or anything like that. Mm. So we have had people in who just. But Joey Barton, he definitely come from above. I don't know where it come from, but you know he got special. Yeah, privileges. he's got. He's, he's going to have a lot of pull. Do you know what I mean? He's yeah. because of who he is. Because if anything happens to him in there, it's going to be a shitstorm in the press. Do you think that's why he gets special privileges because of who he was? Instead of look, you're getting dubbed up twenty three hours a day here. You're going to get fucking learned. I, I don't lesson. know. I don't know, but you know, if if you look at the guy himself, he's just he's just an angry bastard, isn't he? He's carried on with the same sort of. Yeah. training ground bust ups and stuff like yeah. that so well he's kept out of trouble the last few years so I someone get, pulled strings for him definitely yeah. because obviously the family history it must have been difficult for him to maybe what have we, an yeah, well, his cousin and certainly yeah. his brother um, yeah very much so mm -hmm. big Alan Lord I had Alan on my podcast yeah. Strange Ways Riots yep. spent over 30 years in the jail yep. um, a decent big guy how was it with Alan? Did, were you then when he was there? No. I'd like to meet me and chat. I have no mm -hmm. problem with anybody. You know what I mean? You do mm -hmm. your time. Um, whether you want to talk to me, being an ex is another thing. Like Because, you know, I, I remember seeing him talking about uh, being in the block in strange ways as a youngster, 21, walked, walked across the landing, didn't follow the line that you have to line. Go behind his cell. Someone rabbit punched him, called him a black bastard. Yeah. The prison service created people. Bronson people like that do you know what mm -hmm. I mean you know the brutality in that and and some people just keep back don't they mm -hmm. so you know yeah going through that kind of trauma then because he did receive a lot of racism and hatred I, I just the, but he's out now and he's trying to get his film done it'd be an interesting one for the two years to sit across well, well, and, and do you know exchange what? stories I, I, I would I, interest me anyway mm -hmm. do you know what I mean meeting different people and talking to different people um, you know Sean that would have yeah shout met, out to Shawnee boy Wild man. Crazy yeah. bastard. Was, was he ever in? Strange not, ways. Not that I know of. No, I don't think he was. However, do you know what? We got on like an house on fire. Mm. Absolutely got on like a fucking house on fire. And, you know, I've done that job. They've both been inside. I, I said to them, if I'd have been knocking around with you fuckers, I'd have ended up in bloody, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you know, same shit raving and bollocks mm. like that. So yeah. that's just how it goes, doesn't it? But do you feel as if you've got to have that extra bit of protection because of your job because you're not a fucking alien you worked inside the prison system but do you think people look at you differently do you, do you feel as if right the, the tag like i said with yeah. social media x screw you know people are just gonna uh, another fucking bullying bastard another typical <laughs> screw they are aren't they another typical... <laughs> however you know like wild man and that you, you just connect and get on yeah you chat and away you go so i would like to meet people like that mm -hmm. Um, but you should because I had Neil Woods on as well undercover copper yeah I saw that um, I saw that he struggles with PSD self and of course he will yeah he goes through a lot of shit but he's on social media he's trying to rectify all the stuff that he did in the past right I, I appreciate what you're trying to do you know I saw your homeless thing and that it's a really good thing I, I me for me it's mental health prison mental yeah. health so I need to obviously I've done a book I like another book from the point of view of Screw but if I come at it, I've, it's got to be, I'm a civilian now, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's four years since they've been last shift, three years since, be, so I'd like to meet these people. I still need to talk about it. I won't, you know, mm -hmm. till me dying day, if I get a chance to speak about prison, I will, mm -hmm. but I will tell it honest. I'm not going to pull no punches or anything yeah. like that. You know, it's, it's not a good system in my time. And it was certainly worse, you know, when there was all brutality and yeah. that, but if, if they want to make changes or whatever, you need people to listen. And you can't cut budgets. Mm -hmm. But definitely, I, you know, I can imagine it. I think it'd be great. Yeah. You know, sit there with people like that and away you go. Yeah, just shoot the shit. Yeah. 
you struggle with PTSD yourself? Were you attacked inside Strange Ways Prison? Um, right, let me tell you about PTSD. Um, so I, I dealt with a couple of consultants, yeah, mm -hmm. when I was on the seat and when I got finished. One of them said, uh, you've never been in life-threatening situations, you haven't got PTSD. Other one said, he's chatting bollocks, anyone can get PTSD. The thing with PTSD, it don't want to become like a bad back. Everyone has a bad back. So what I don't want is somebody to say, I've got PTSD, and people dismiss it. Yeah, They've started calling it uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome in America, in some cases, mm -hmm. and they've gone away from the disorder. I work with officers who involved in one incident that finished them. One incident, and it finished them. Because you don't know how it's going to affect them. Yeah, not necessarily a death in custody. For me, PTSD, it didn't stop me going to work. You know, I had nightmares dealing with things. You find a dead body, you see someone cutting themselves. The lad with brain damage That's eating trauma. the Quran. Of course it is. It never stopped me going to work. Once I was on the sick and I come away... It, it affects it. It added to my mental health woes because I couldn't shut down. My sleep is horrendous. You know, last three months, it's got really bad again. We've had a bit of change in his lives. And I think if you, you've had a bit of mental trauma, a lot of change, even though it's positive, can upset you. You know, so it's a bad thing. There'll be prisoners who have PTSD, loads of people. Me, I, I put myself through, went to see a psychologist, you know, applied myself, Salford, saw a counsellor who basically said, I can't deal with that. Saw a psychologist who was lovely, who just sat and listened. All I wanted was someone to listen. No fancy CBT or strategies. I just talked for four months and she listened, bless her. Um, he screwed her up. I asked her uh, midway through, I says, do you have any, anything? You know, obviously, if you're listening to shit all day. And she says... Since I started seeing you. <laughs> yeah, and the writer I worked with the book, uh, I, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the same, after the first week of doing the book, I was really fucked up, not sleeping, because it's all going through your mind. Yeah, bringing it all to the surface he, again. He, he says, well, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm having nightmares about it. <laughs> you know, so it, it does affect you. It didn't stop me going to work, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, I've got a lot of anger me. I've got a lot of anger with how people are treated, mm -hmm. not just prisoners, staff, you know, um, staff should look after each other. All managers need to do in the prison service is look after the staff. And it is a cold place. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There's no aftercare, no nothing like that. But what I would like to do, I'm either going to go into my contemporary therapies or I'd like someone to buy me a little uh, house in Wakefield, terraced house, three or four rooms, kitchen and a bathroom, staff it with volunteers who've had bad experiences, suffer PTSD, child traumas, and just get them to come in. Men are shit at talking. Yeah. Every time I turn up for the psych psychologist, I'll tell you now, two hours before, I've got diarrhea. I'm sat there with knots in my stomach to go in with this lass, bless her, and pour my heart out. You know, it was, I found it really difficult going. It helped me. The, the same day after, I was euphoric for three or four hours. You know, that evening or the following morning, my missus, bless her, Amy, and my daughter, Billy, would be out of my road because I was a fucking beast. Mm -hmm. It had just, it was like a relief, and then it had come back, and I was fucking angry. Yeah, but and talking it, about that emotion and, and trauma, it brings it to the surface, so you automatically feel that connection because your your brain's repeating that, so your brain doesn't know what's oh, it does. real or what's fake. I, I can't shut down me things. I told you, a, a mm -hmm. memory from my childhood has come back in, into my head in the last two weeks, something from nearly 40 years ago, that is stopping me sleeping. You know, a week last Wednesday, and I can remember when it works, I'm looking at clock at half one, and then at six o'clock, I'm getting up and taking dog out, and that memory is just... Clear as day. Yeah. So, like yourself, the homeless thing and that, I'd really love to help people. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can come at it from the point of view of an ex-screw, and like I say, it might I might go into complementary therapies, but, you know, like Sean Atwood and that, I'd, I'd love to do some motivational speaking. Yeah. But like he says, he says you need to promote yourself and have a platform. Yeah. So, you know, maybe I'll set myself up a Twitter account, yeah. take it on chin, and just look at the positives. Listen, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. You come across a very well-educated man. You speak very well. Listen, you brought your book out. It's not as if you're trying to pull the wheel over people's eyes. You're being as honest as you can be. Yeah. 
it's going to be that's just a bit of fear as well what's people going to think but fuck everyone else because there's people like Look, Donald Trump's got Twitter no, I'm over, do you know what it is you're I'll overthinking you it I'm, I'm not fearful right Sean Atwood's podcast yeah so I read all. I, I read every comment for mm -hmm. feedback you know some positive some from his American audience and that some people are hateful straight off but but I last started reading it so I think it's about my family as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to put them. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. strong. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. So, you know, I might have a chat with my missus. Mm -hmm. My daughter's well out of it. She's protected, yeah? Mm -hmm. Bless her. Um, my missus, she's a strong character. She's had her own traumas in the past. Yeah. So, so maybe I will have a go and just tell her not to. But yeah, tell them not to read the comments, which is difficult, especially yeah. at the start. Yeah. I read every comment for a year but self-seeking when I was getting the praise I yeah. loved it negativity I would go in my room and hide nowadays me and Steph are driving down it's just part and parcel of the game the negative shit that I get people my teeth my fake tan this and that people making up shit you just got to take it in the chin I just like to say I'm not used to meeting like you know good looking guys thank you in DG hotels <laughs> late at night but yeah so you see fucking teeth are shining <laughs> so you see but yeah you know I, mm -hmm. I definitely want to help people yeah. the best way I can and you know Sean's had people on there is, you know, ex-addicts, one or two that are out there. But, you know, get a big team of people. Mm -hmm. You need to get in schools and educate people on the prison front. But there's shitloads of people. I've had messages. On Messenger, right? It's under Sam Samworth. I've had people, <laughs> my missus, I'm, I'm really ignorant as well. I'm shit on computer. A few months ago, she says, you got loads of messages, you. says, where? She says, you have to accept them because they're not your friends. You know, put me security settings really mm -hmm. tight. Really positive messages, loads of them. Um, one at last one, career soldier, ex-copper. He says, I thought it were only me, Sam. You know, I'm heading for a nervous breakdown. My marriage is going to fucking shit. And now I've read your book mm -hmm. and I've seen the light. I've got my missus to read it. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, read that book. She read it and I said, that's me. And it cleared the air. I'm going to go for counselling and that. Mm -hmm. and and that's what I want I want to reach a big audience yeah. but to reach a bigger audience set up maybe a Twitter put it on private maybe at the start build up the confidence when you realise wait a minute it's not for that me, bad you know I, I can just look at the positives mm -hmm. I said with a book if one person gets in touch and said yeah I'm fucked up I'm going to go and get help yeah. now but that'll set you up a platform to maybe go and speak in schools prisons people can get in touch do you want to leave an email or anything for people maybe you can go and speak at a school or prison if anybody's watching do you want to leave anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll give contact? you an email. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have a go at Messenger. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll give you... Well, they can contact me on Messenger, Sam Samworth. Okay. You know, I, I will have to accept mm -hmm. it, um, which is fair enough. I'll give you my email. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to have a chat with the missus when I go home yeah. about setting up a Twitter account and maybe put myself out there. The thing is, it, it's all life experiences. You know what I mean? Some of the stuff I saw in engineering was mm -hmm. frigging horrendous or yeah. whatever. Um but I just want to help people. Yeah. I am a people But person. the majority of people are struggling. You've been through a lot of shit in your life as well, but you're dealing with it. So for you to be the lead by example, you've got to be at the forefront. You've got to be willing to take the grenades and the punches for other people to maybe see the light, the message from the man who was in the army to say, you've given me the strength. That's what you need. That's what keeps you going to realise, fuck it if I get 10 oh, negatives. I, oh, I, I, I would buzz off that, mate. Mm -hmm. Helping people, definitely. Do you yeah. know what I mean? That would keep me going. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I'll have a word with Amy Blesser. Mm -hmm. um, when I get home. How long did it take to write your book? Right. I'm glad you've asked me that. So, um, two weeks. I worked with a writer, Yorkshire lad, hooked up with him. Before he got a contract, bless him, he said, uh, let's sit down and do this book. So no notes, no diaries, no nothing. We sat down, uh, Junction 25, M62, Holiday Inn. It's got a nice reception. They serve coffee, 10 o'clock, while three, four every day. Monday to Friday, two weeks. So we sat down, we got us coffee, he put Dick to phone, tell me a life story, Sam. The very last day, the Thursday night, as we were finishing on the Friday, he says, right, I need this a bit structured and have you got this, this and this? So the last day was structured, the rest of it, I just told my story, like I've sat with you. The, the thing is that I found incredible is my memory has just got better and better and better which in some ways is not good because these things I'm never going to forget. However, the detail in that is there. I could talk all day, mate. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I could just... change the batteries on these cameras. <laughs> <laughs> but it's right, you know. Mm -hmm. So the book's out now. 
You're feeling better. Yep. What's the plans for the future? Uh, I'll tell you what the plans are. You're going to keep in touch. Yes. Like Sean. Of course. Um, I'm, go I'm going to have a serious chat tonight with the missus, mm -hmm. uh, Amy. I've got to give her a shout because you know what? Prison officers, families. Yeah. Families of prisoners suffer, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Prison officers, families, you know, she had a dog's life. You know, you know, there was no violence or anything like that, but she spent, Billy, my daughter, um, 2015, I get injured, September, I'm at home all the time. She hasn't seen me for five years. I'm going house at six, coming in at 10, she's grown up. We're banging heads straight away. You know, me and the missus have had very little contact. I've done stupid amount of hours. So when I was quite ill, mentally, off work, we, we lived in each other's pockets for two years. That tests your relationship. Mm -hmm. But we are strong. Do you know what I mean? But families do suffer as well. It's I, I thought I was leaving everything at the gate when I went home. You know, Amy does a little bit in the book. Um, it, it wasn't edited or anything. I give it to Tony the writer. He read it and he just put it in as it were, you know, me coming home stinking as shit, you know, she'd spend all day cleaning, cook a nice meal, I'd walk in the door, drop me clothes, she'd walk to wash her, put a minx to stank at shit, and then I'd sit on settee with fucking face on all night, do you know what I mean? What's the hourly rate for a prison officer? Right, prison officers, when I was in, after a period of time, you're on 29 grand, yeah? Private sector were 22, prison officers now, on the website, says 22 to 29, 29's experienced staff, you get 22 grand now, they get a good overtime rate, but and this is not slagging anyone in retail at all. Twenty-two grand, you know, going to retail job, put a few hours in, you're going to come close to that. It is not worth it. It's not worth your mental health. It's not worth your family. Mm -hmm. It's not worth your relationships. Yeah, because everybody's suffering. It's like people who go to the army. The majority of people who are homeless on the streets are ex army. It's, yeah. it's sad. It's yeah. th sad that people. That anyone's on it's the streets any, uh, yeah, any, any job, anything, there's always going to be some sort of conflict. There's always going to be some sort of negativity. But prison system, it's like it's war. Shit. It's like war. It's, it's like war but as If they well. don't do anything, uh -huh. you know, the, the first thing I do is sit down with a government minister. Well, we can do this, this and this. What about a budget? Oh, we're going to have to cut. How can you cut mm -hmm. budgets? The country's getting bigger. How can you cut fire, police, ambulance and everything else? Mm -hmm. You can't. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So... What it needs is a think tank or something because what happens, you know, your, your last prison minister, your Rory, the little spit his dummy out when he didn't become prime minister, I'm going to do this all big on TV. Six months into the job, he's not doing it anymore. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? People come and go and they bring their own ideas which aren't necessarily going to work. Mm. Take it back to grassroots, you know, speak to prison officers if you want to know what to do and people who've been in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'd love to see, like, question time with a mixed prison officer, obviously good ones like myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and ex-customers mm -hmm. just firing questions. Yeah. Get the ministers up there mm -hmm. and put them on the spot. Yeah. So everything you've been through, Sam, you've learned from it, and now you want to try and motivate people and educate people. Motivation would yeah. be fantastic. So, and just help people. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, if they come and talk. Mm -hmm. in, in my mind, if I was a billionaire, I would have a little house, like I've said, I'd have one in Wakefield. I'd have a couple in Sheffield. I'd have a couple Glasgow. in Leeds. Yeah, <laughs> Glasgow, obviously, probably a big block of flats. <laughs> but, you know, when you see some of the people you have mm -hmm. on, they don't necessarily need professional help, a counsellor yeah. or some psychologist. Mm -hmm. Just sit down with someone like me. I'll listen. I'll mm -hmm. tell him my experiences and, yeah. and try and help them that way. Do you know what I mean? Where can people buy your book, Sam? It's on Amazon. Kindle. Yeah, we'll put the uh, links audio on the book. So for anybody, buy it. It's a great read. Great story. Sam, for coming on today, brother, and telling your story. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. And all the best for the future. Keep in touch. Yeah, well. And, uh, you know, we'll yeah. sort some out. Yeah, yeah, well. Fuck that. Delete his number, my more. Let's go, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thank you.